Okay, so. Okay, so Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Today we are going to um, start learning about morphogenesis. And as you know, morphogenesis is basically uh, all about creation of order in. Uh, in early developmental stages. The embryo uh, at early embryonic development is a two-dimensional structure and after morphogenesis, which basically involves the gastrulation movements, uh, the embryo uh, becomes 3D uh, structure. So in simple, we define morphogenesis as change in form. So, as I said, uh, it involves uh, movements of the cells um, and the prior sheets of the cells, which are at the blastocyst stage, with, where the embryo is just a two-dimensional structure. It, these cells in the blastocyst stage, they start moving and uh, it involves large-scale movement of the cells and that movement is actually bringing these cells in the appropriate positions uh, according to the future body plan. Uh, there is a um, complete rearrangement of the cells, as you know, uh, at blastocyst stage in uh, vertebrates, embryo has a fluid filled cavity, all the uh, embryonic cells are organized like a disc shaped uh, structure and then you have uh, these uh, the trophoblast uh, and the trophoblast giant cells which are converted into placenta in case of mammals so from here the embryo moves into uh, in, in such a way that if I try to draw just the embryonic cells, which are, are disc-shaped cells, we see the earlier sign of uh, cell movement involves this, uh, the physical sign involves the uh, formation of primitive streak uh, in mammals. Uh, or in other organisms, for example, in, in Xenopus, uh, which is a vertebrate, you see uh, the ectodermal cells moving inwards, um, which we call the uh, dorsal lip of the blastopore. And where cells become slightly constricted, the cells which, which are referred to as bottle cells, and the ectodermal cells, they start moving inwards. And the end result is there is a complete rearrangement. Eventually, these cells they are organized as ecto, meso, and endodermal cells. And we know, we already learned that these germ layers and these layers of cells, which are called ecto, meso, and endo, they are basically the, um, this distinction between ecto, meso, and endo is actually going to end up in formation of spe uh, specialized tissues and organs. For example, endoderm uh, develops into gut and it's separated from the rest of the ectoderm by a layer of mesoderm, okay? So these, as I said, these movements are uh, large scale movements. These are drastic changes in the overall structure of the embryo that converts it into a complex 3D structure. Um, mesoderm, endoderm, uh, they move from outside to inside. I just told you, um, you have, if, if you recall, the cells in uh, Xenopus, uh, in case of uh, Xenopus embryo, where you have uh, these, all this, if I encircle them, 
if all this is endoderm and this is the uh, ectodermal cells. Okay. And at this particular point, this particular point, we have this, you know, bottle cells. And these ectodermal cells, they then move in the direction of arrow like this. And eventually this embryo has three distinct germ layers. Now, I think we did, I did mention in some of my earlier lectures, but it's important and relevant in this lecture. If we take these cells, uh, which are, uh, if we take this embryo, and we separate them as single cells. Okay. We capture single cells. Uh, and now nowadays we can do this. So if we now do single cell RNA sick or transcription profiling to see which genes are uh, expressed in each of this uh, cell. So once we will get the expression profile of these embryos and based on the expression profile, gene A is active, gene B is active, gene XYZ are off, etc. If we cluster, if we organize and it's a very unbiased approach so just based on the expression profile these cells i mean here i'm drawing a circle but each circle is representing an independent expression profile what we see we see three clusters coming up and these three clusters are actually representing ecto, meso, endo, whatever way you, you organize them. So it means this change in form of embryo, it involves underlying changes in the gene expression patterns. Um, and you know, the future foundation, the foundation for future cell lineages or what we can say already here, we have three different specialized cell types, three different specialized cell types. Then each of the cell type will further go, you know, changes in gene expression. And then we will have further specialization in different cell lineages are formed. Now, why this is required? Uh, this is required so that we can have clearly distinguish cell, uh, cell types, because these cells are founder cells of future cell lineages. Um, and those cell lineages are going to contribute to different tissues and organs in our body. So this is very important uh, that we, we should have not just morphological changes in our mind, we should be able to correlate with the underlying cell biological and molecular biological changes within the cell. Now one wonders um, what is happening in embryo if you know the cell shape apparently looks same, if there's no major change in cell shape, uh, how embryo goes from here to this stage, so where you have just, uh, you know, uh, this disc-shaped cells, the embryonic cells. I mean, this is a two-dimensional structure where cells are organized like this. Or if you recall, uh, embryo early embryonic development in, in fruit flies, we have a cylinder, which was the embryo like this, and we have uh, cells, you know, organized in just a uh, single layer, okay, along the uh, periphery of the embryo. Now, how cells decide that they are going to move, whether you are a vertebrate embryo or you are an invertebrate embryo, 
what kind of forces are there? So there's a whole, uh, I would say, physics involved here. Uh, so we understand them uh, through using different biophysical tools. Uh, and, you know, the cell motility uh, involves change in cell shape. And this change in cell shape results in loss of cell adhesion. When I say I'm going to move a cell, let's say out of this, I'm going to move these two cells like this inward. It means I have to detach these two cells and these two cells. Then when these two cells are going to move in, you cannot leave a gap here. It means this needs to be filled in. And while these cells may move in, they may drag or push certain forces on the neighboring cells. And this is what results in change in cell shape. Uh, and eventually we uh, achieve the motility of the cells. In some cases, the cell to cell junctions are completely lost and cells are moving like a, like a, you know, a, a stream uh, of water. Now, uh, what is very important to remember that at the stage of gastrulation, there are very few to no cell division. There is little to no increase in cell number. Little to no increase in the cell number or cell mass. Um, cell division pretty much comes to a halt temporarily and then these movements take place and cells again start dividing. It means the role of cell motility uh, with the help of which basically involves change in cell shape and when we will involve change in cell shape that means we have to lose cell to cell junctions or cell to cell connections or cell adhesions. Now, in today's lecture, we are going to look through different organisms, how different organisms uh, go through the process of morphogenesis or stage of morphogenesis and, and this 3D structure is uh, achieved. For example, we are going to see uh, sea urchin. It's a, it's a small uh, organism in, in the oceans. Then we have uh, a little monster which haunts us again and again in uh, developmental biology, that is uh, Drosophila. Uh, we have the uh, Xenopus, and uh, towards the end, we are going to see the zebrafish. And when we say uh, movements, uh, Philopodia are these you know, structures which are here like projections from the cell. So just like my, my pen, uh, you know, the cell becomes constructed on one side and, you know, it becomes like hair-like thing. Um, I think the best example is uh, the role of philopodia is if you have seen uh, Spider-Man movie. Uh, so when he, uh, you know, uh, climbs on the wall, you see that just like this long thread of spider, that is the philopodial structure which helps cell or the, or the spider uh, move uh, long distances. So let's see gastrulation uh, in the morphogenesis process in sea urchin. Um, in case of gastrulation in sea urchin, what we should uh, learn that is, yeah, so here is the urchin. Uh, this is the blasto, uh, blastula stage. And cells are, all these are cells organized uh, in around the periphery. There is a fluid filled cavity here. Uh, here you have the endoderm, presumptive endoderm, and then this is the mesoderm. Now, the gastrulation in C. urchin, it involves what we refer to as epithelial to mesenchyme transition. Do you remember what is epithelium? 
And what is mesenchyme? Hmm? Kariha? What is sir, epithelium? Epith sir, epithelium is the top layer of the cells. The cells that are present on these, like the main uh, surface, like on these inside of any uh, cavity or something. G. Fatima, Rahman. So I guess epithelial basically is the layer that lines the organs and these are the specialized cells which line the organs. And uh, I think- How you will is... identify if I give you epithelium and mesenchyme cells? How will you identify? Hania, Google, okay? Yeah, So Hania is wondering whether I was sitting next to her. How do I know this? <laughs> Mama Baba knows everything. Hmm? Ji Nurulain. Sir, okay, I think like the cells key morphology different, Ogi. That's how you can like determine how they're different. G marriage. So epithelium cells usually are more uniform in their size and also in their arrangement. Severa. हमने ये दूसरे के तीसरे लेक्चर में डिस्कस किए थे epithelial to mesenchyme transitions or epithelium and mesenchyme. Can you recall the lecture? Nurul Huda? Mesenchyme, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, um, जो epithelium cells होते हैं वो थोड़े से uniform in shape होते हैं और um, squarish होते हैं but I'm not sure about these kind cells. Ahmed Nakvi. Uh, sir, no idea. No idea. Abdullah Johar. Uh. If I take a hint, I think the epithelial cells are the outer line cells, and uh, so they tend to be a bit sac shaped, a bit of flat. But other than that, I don't recall much. Bad. So, epithelial cells are basically organized in a layer and they are all connected. You remember in case of example where we saw, you know, feathers of birds and then, you know, uh, same kind of cells giving dermis, epidermis, etc. Uh, and then the mesenchymal cells, they are loosely connected or, you know, they are not organized as, as a proper layer of uh, cells. Um, here, if I uh, try to show you. So these red ones are the mesenchymal cells. And uh, here, this was the epithelium. Very well organized, uh, you know, uh, well connected with each other, cemented with each other. Uh, that layer of cells is called epithelium. So if I provide you uh, epithelium and the uh, mesenchyme in the same uh, sample, and I ask you to go and look under a microscope, you should be able to easily identify them. So gastrulation in sea urchin involves this epithelial to mesenchyme transition, which means uh, these mesodermal cells, these ones, they detach. So they are uh, well organized. They are attached to each other like this, okay? Like a... Uh, 
single layer of cells, they detach, they lose their cell to cell connections. They move inside the, this cavity uh, and then uh, they cause the movement of endodermal cells. Okay. So you remember I told you uh, how cells achieve gastrulation or movements in gastrulation. They undergo change in the cell shape and this change in cell shape, uh, you know, exert certain biophysical forces on the neighboring cells and that then starts moving. So these cells, um, the cells which detach uh, and move inside, these are the primary mesenchymal cells. They're called primary mesenchymal cells. Uh, and they migrate into blastocyte as single cells. You can see this one is moving, this one is moving, and they are individual cells. Uh, they lose their epithelial polarity. Uh, so the polarity which they had here in epithelium that's lost, uh, cells become cuboid shape. Now, this transition uh, to mesenchyme, uh, it's achieved through uh, intense pulsatory activity uh, that results in invagination of cypress of blastola uh, before migration. And invagination, you can see this is moving inwards now. Okay. Now, how are you going to achieve this epithelial, epithelium to mesenchyme transition? I told you cell to cell connection is to be lost. And in order to achieve this, that there is you know, loss of beta and alpha catenin uh, that then removes, that results in removal of cadherins by endocytosis. And we have loss of cell to cell connections or cell to cell uh, junctions, they are lost and cells move in inwards. Now, once the cells move inwards like this one, which we call the primary mesenchyme, uh, they make a ring-like structure, uh, which is this one, along the invaginated uh, ecto and endoderm. Uh, these mesenchymal cells, you can see now, they are becoming constricted like this. They are making these here like projections. These are called philopodia. Philopodia or podium is the singular and philopodia is the plural. Now, some of these cells, uh, which are here, they start migrating towards the animal pole. So this is the animal pole of the uh, an, uh, animal and this is the vegetal pole of the embryo. So now, if you uh, look at 10 different embryos, you, you will find same movements, but the paths may be different, you know, um, some may be moving here, the other going like this. So the paths which they travel through, they may be different because it's just a big cavity. And with the help of philopodia, they are going to, you know, climb up along the uh, wall. The consequence of this is that the endoderm is being pulled through and eventually we have uh, the gut is formed. On one side, you, you will have the mouth, and on the other side, you will have the anus of the animal. Now, these primary mesenchymal cells, uh, as I told you, they, they, they move on the inner surface of the blastocele, this, this cavity. Uh, and these philopodia, they are uh, quite long in, in terms of uh, cellular structure, like 40 microns. Um, an average, on an average, at a, in a given time, uh, 
uh, within each cell, we have at least six philopodia, uh, which are moving in a, uh, at a given time. Now, the, this is very important. Uh, this is very important results of an experiment. What they did, they took uh, primary mesenchymal cells from the animal pool, uh, for, sorry, primary mesenchymal cells from uh, a CHN embryo, and they injected them here at the animal pool to see how they behave. What they discovered that these primary mesenchymal cells, they will go to the site of primary mesenchyme. Okay, and uh, also, um, if you take cells which have already migrated, for example, these ones, if you take these cells and inject them in a in a <coughs> alhamdulillah in a CHN embryo, the cells which have already migrated, they again restart. They they uh, repro they are reprogrammed in such a way that they again start movement uh, from this point. Okay. Now it means there are certain signals within the uh, blastocell wall or at this particular stage of embryo, which direct cells in a uh, in a specific manner. Uh, to migrate in uh, different directions as primary mesenchyme. So once we have this primary mesenchyme, I told you there will be invagination and extension of endoderm. So here invagination of endoderm started and you see invagination is being extended further, which at the end with the help of you know, prime. So these are the philopodial structures. You can see. Look, look at this one. Uh, look at this one. And this uh, endoderm uh, invagination. Uh, it's it's a uh, it takes place as, as a continuous structure of cells uh, in two phases. In first phase, it's just this short and and squat uh, cylindrical structure which is here it pauses a bit and in the second phase now these uh, the the because these were the primary mesenchyme cells here from here onward you have now the secondary mesenchyme these ones which pulls the which pull the endoderm all the way uh, towards the end of animal uh, towards the animal pole and then we have a gut form, which is mouth and anus on the other end. Now, how this endoderm invagination starts? <clears throat> we said, you know, we have to lose uh, cadherins, you know, alpha, beta, uh, alpha, beta, catenins. Uh, removal of cadherin junctions, uh, and then you know we you know, will uh, experience change in cell shape as well as uh, certain physical force. I involved. Now this change uh, in the shape of endoderm <clears throat> cells. Let's talk about this one. Now we are talking about this invagination, and then eventual movement inwards. How this, all this kicks off, how all this starts. <clears throat> so the initial change is just a small change <clears throat> in the shape of the cells, very few uh, cells, a small number of cells, they experience this change in the, uh, in, in the uh, cell shape, which is in the form of a curvature, just curve, slight curve, but that is, uh, due to, you know, these are actually cytoskeletal uh, proteins. And these cytoskeletal proteins, they uh, exert force on one side, cell 
<clears throat> go from cubite uh, cell shape to elongated wedge. Now you see here a wedge like structure is being formed here. Okay. Uh, cell uh, shape is changing and there is and this keeps increasing yeah. and the, you you can see cell is being constricted on one one side the other side is still li like broad like this one but the other side is slowly becoming constricted due to uh, contraction of cytoskeletal proteins and this uh, event is initially sufficient to pull the outer surface inwards. Now you can see due to this change in cell shape, you have these cells are being pulled inwards or invagination has started. The, the initial invagination is due to change in cell shape and the secondary or the second phase of invagination is due to the secondary mesenchyme, uh, which is philopodia, and uh, there is also philopodia independent movement as well. This is what I just explained you. So this is the primary invagination just started. This involves change in cell shape. If you pay attention here, there is constriction uh, is being uh, cells are being constricted on on one side uh, they are becoming uh, elongated um, instead of being cuboid and then you can see this change in cell shape or these forces which started from just two cells it's being extended to the neighboring cells as well more cells undergo change in cell shape and this results in primary invagination. And then of course, secondary invagination, the pull is due to the uh, philopodial structure eventually. Okay, let's come back to our favorite system, Drosophila. Uh, it's not your favorite, but definitely mine um, because I, I, I love this system. This little monster has taught us so much. So in fruit flies, let me remind you what we learned in earlier lectures. We learned that on the ventral side of the embryo, there is sudden invagination. So these ectodermal cells, which were here, they they move inwards and we call that structure in flies as ventral furrow because it, it appears as a furrow okay now what are these uh, how this ventral furrow is formed along the anterior posterior uh, axis of of uh, fly embryo there is a tensile so these 10 cells, you can see they are undergoing change in cell shape here. And the end result is they all leave their position from here and move inwards. And when they come inward, they make a tube-like structure. And that tube-like structure is formed now. So you still have on the outer side, you have these cells. Only these ectodermal cells, they moved in, uh, sorry, mesodermal cells, they moved inwards. They made a tube-like structure here, but eventually these tube-like, the cells which make tube-like structure, they disintegrate and they, uh, you know, uh, lay inside the embryo. So this uh, invagination of mesoderm um, is very fast. Uh, you know, this, this takes, uh, tube-like structure takes just 30 minutes. And then uh, this is followed by uh, 
spread of cells uh, on the interior face of the ectoderm. So this is the inner side of the ectoderm. Uh, now this uh, invagination also takes place in two phases. First one I told you there is a central strip of cells, which are these ones. They undergo change in cell shape uh, and this involves smaller apical surface uh, is formed due to apical con contraction, just like the constriction we saw here cell become wedge-shaped like this, okay? So similarly, uh, these cells undergo this first phase of invagination. And then the second phase is basically this one where the cells which form tube-like structure, they dissociate uh, into individual cells uh, and then they proliferate and spread laterally like this along the embryo, okay? Now, what are the molecular events uh, which are happening in uh, the mesodermal invagination or mesoderm invagination? You have to remember uh, the body axis. Yeah, I, I could have written here. What, which body axis is this? This is dorsal and this is ventral. Okay. And then of course, it's a tube-like structure. If I you know, draw a straight line like this, uh, on this side, we'll have anterior axis and the posterior axis of that, uh, if it is a tube-like structure. Now, you remember when we learned about dorsal ventral, Access formation uh, during early uh, embryonic development, and we said, you know, at the stage of syncytial blastoderm, the protein called dorsal moves into the nucleus. Okay, uh, and this was the mesoderm there. You remember? If you don't remember, let me remind you. So dorsal activates twist and snail, and we are actually going back to that now. The molecular event that involves in the this invagination of mesoderm, uh, this is dorsal ventral side, uh, that we owe to activation of twist and snail. Because what they discovered that twist and snail mutants, uh, they have defected invagination of mesoderm. If you have uh, mut twist mutant, you have just a transient furrow. And if you have a snail mutant, cells are flat and they don't undergo changes. Okay. And we already uh, have talked in detail about expression of twist and snail in the mesoderm in response to dorsal protein, which gets activated after activation of toll receptor, which results in degradation of cactus, which normally holds dorsal. So that is actually happening here and dorsal eventually uh, activates twist and snail. Now, how twist and snail are achieving this? So twist and snail being transcription factor, uh, they uh, activate encoderins. So at before activation of twist and snail, we have e cadherins are uh, present in the cell. As soon as twist and snail come in, there is a transition, so they activate the n cadherin. And this n cadherin results in spreading of the mesodermal cells. Snail represses the e cadherin and twist activates the n cadherin. Look at the, how they go. Uh, so they both are activated by dorsal at the same time. One goes and turns off the e cadherins, and the other one activates the n cadherins, which is important for this uh, invagination of mesoderm. What is time now? Fifty-two, sir. 
Okay, let's take a break here and then we come back in 10 minutes. Okay. So, let's see another very beautiful example of uh, gastrulation movements in Drosophila or something which is amazing. I, I love uh, thinking about this uh, event and that is called germ band extension. What happens uh, in germ band extension, there's actually a, a astonishingly uh, dramatic increase in the length uh, of the epithelial layer. And this length of the epithelial layer, uh, which normally forms the thorax and the abdomen. So if, let's say, if this is the, size of the epithelial layer in Drosophila, which is going to make thorax and then the abdomen of the fly, it becomes of this length. And what is astonishingly uh, dramatic here is that there is no cell division or change in shape that is involved here. So one wonders if I have let's say 100 cells here from 1 to 100, how I can increase the length of the epithelial layer while keeping the same number of the cells, their size, shape, everything is same. So it turns out, it turned out that there is a rearrangement of the ventral part of the epithelium. The, the cells, they undergo a myosin dependent intercalation. So cells which were, let's say, organized like this, I'm just drawing like this. These cells, they intercalate in these cells, which means this cell and this cell is going to lose their connection. This cell and this cell is going to lose this their connection. And the end result is this cell becoming here. One, two, and three. This one becoming in between this and this one. So this way you have one, two, three, four, five. So all the 10 cells, they become organized in such a way and, and, and what we know that this is, this involves uh, myosin dependence. Um, now, what happens if you pay attention on, on this uh, figure, this is a long anterior posterior axis. Um, and, you know, this regular hexagons, their boundaries are uh, parallel to dorsal ventral axis or at you know the 60 degree to the dorsal ventral axis they are going to lose so lose these connections and this cell is going to intercalate like this you see the gray ones they lost their junction here, here, and here. Also, these two places, and new junctions are formed. So the start of uh, germ band extension, it involves uh, adherence junctions on the face, which is parallel to dorsal ventral axis, that sh gets shrunk, uh, disappear, and cells become diamond shaped and they eventually become intercalated inside the cells which are uh, ventral to them. And all these layers undergo same uh, intercalation. Look, this gray one uh, gets into the mustard, the, this whatever color you call this uh, 
magenta goes into these blue ones okay and uh, green goes in. so you keep the number of the cells remain same there's no increase in the cell shape but there is an increase in the length of the uh, epithelial layer now why we call this germ band extension in our earlier lectures about fruit fly development we said you know the pole cells which are formed at the most posterior part of the embryo uh, they undergo a massive movement as a result of germ band extension so all these cells which are going on the ventral side now i'm talking about this germ band extension this event this extension takes place sorry and the po pole cells which were here they end up due to this extension they end up here we can through microscopy we can see them okay and then after germ band extension everything is retracted again and that is called then germ band retraction which means this rearrangement again undergoes certain changes and after some time these pole cells they come back here so this one is germ band extension which involves these movements and then eventually uh, after some time uh, which is few minutes there is germ band retraction taking place so there is another beautiful example of uh, cell movements uh, change in cell shapes or involvement of filopodia uh, in drosophila and that is at the stage of dorsal cloia we when we were talking about uh, where is the white space here when we were talking about dorsal ventral axis formation dorsal and ventral axis formation we said that the maximum concentration of dpp is at the most dorsal region which is called amniocerosa and we said this is not embryonic region this is not part of the proper embryo so actually what is happening this is that region which we refer to as amniocerosa the most dorsal region that remains as a, as a uh, after germ band gets retracted uh, you know and nearly 11 hours after the embryogenesis and gestulation is complete even segments are formed 11 hours is a time where segmentation is already complete and this is advanced embryonic stage okay the top area here you can see the segments are made already we have very well formed segments however this cavity which is amniocerosa on the top surface of embryo it is still not covered with epidermis it's still like you know open let's say my there is a cavity on my top of my head and um, in order to zip this gap uh, by movement of cells in the epidermal cells that is called dorsal cloia because we have to close this gap this cavity and this involves two hours of zipping the open area by movement of epidermis so epidermal cells from both sides they are pulled through filopodia filopodial movements of cells in the epidermis and the, these filopodia they extend up to 10 micron this zipping event is so precise that you know look the segments are being aligned perfectly 
it's not that one segment by mistake gets zipped with the other one like a crisscross it's so precise event uh, and it involves g and k cell signaling jun n terminal kinase cell signaling which activates the gtpas rack in the dorsal closure uh, just like drosophila dorsal closure we have ventral closure in c elegans um, if you ablate the philopodia let's say you take a laser and you ablate the philopodial structures uh, you know the dorsal closure ventral ventral closure in c elegans um, it's disrupted um, there are defects in embryo which means the philopodial structures they have very specialized role in response to this gnk signaling uh, etc is it clear so far and this is this is what the close scanning electron micrograph uh, of dorsal closure you can see these thread like structures are basically the philopodial uh, movements okay this is the uh, xenopus um, gastrulation in 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 xenopus in the in the beginning of today's lecture i reminded you a bit again the result is you know uh, as a result of this uh, morphogenetic event uh, embryo uh, is transformed from you know 2d to a 3d structure so this is the animal pole the this yellow ones are future uh, presumptive uh, endoderm ectoderm, uh, ectoderm and this is the uh, mesoderm now what happens uh, we have change in cell shape which is taking place here at this particular point these cells are called bottle cells they undergo change like this they, they, they become constricted and you know uh, their convergence uh, results in this involution of these red cells which are the mesodermal cells uh, and this involution or invagination results in you know large scale movement of these cells which also involves the uh, movement of endodermal cells which are initially here at the blastocyst stage they also while while embryo undergoes this uh, process of morphogenesis at the epiboly stage what we can see we have uh, primitive gut or what we call the arcanetron is being formed here and embryo is now uh, the blue one is the ectoderm the red one is uh, mesoderm we have very clear three distinct layers of cells uh, ecto meso and endoderm um, so involution is is rolling in of coherent sheet of endodermal cells uh, and the mesoderm so this was the mesoderm and then this is the involution of mesodermal cells um, formation of the this is the first event i told you the change in cell shape uh, is the first sign of gastrulation uh, in in xenopus and this change in cell shape it forms a minor groove this one which we call the dorsal lip of the blastopore okay and this is the point from where uh, you know uh, these cells invaginate or involution starts and this uh, region is also that corresponds to we learned in our earlier lecture the spiemann organizer if you take you know this region and graft it on another embryo it results in formation of a complete rudimentary embryo uh, yeah this is uh, the same but zoomed in uh, you have um, the the point where these are the bottle cells you can see very clearly they are undergoing change in cell shape which provides the space for uh, 
uh, minor groove and then involution of uh, these mesodermal cells or the involution of uh, endodermal cells take place and embryo eventually becomes a 3d structure i would like you to go and read about uh, that's an assignment for you so role of Bracky Yuri in uh, in gastrulation. Read in context of zebrafish. Okay, and you know it's it's here. You can see um, this is basically staining of Bracky Yuri. You should read what actually happens at molecular level okay when these morphological changes are taking place i i i told you uh, in the beginning of this course we have to emphasize on learning the genetic molecular and biochemical basis of development so in case of xenopus we just said you know these are the morphological changes in case of uh, fly, sea elegant, uh, fly and uh, sea urchin, etc. We did look at the molecular, but I would like you to go and read about the, uh, and I have already highlighted brachyuri, but you should read about uh, what actually is happening uh, at the gastrulation at, at molecular level. Um, and brachyuri, you will find one of the key factor there. So with that, uh, we are done with today's lecture. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Any questions? And we have recitation today. Is it true? 6.15, we will meet today in recitation. So if there are no more questions, uh, I wish you all a wonderful day there. So, Allah Hafiz.